Okay, welcome to the continuing guest lecture series of the Music Technology Program at Georgia Southern for the 2021 academic year. And today we have with us Dr. Lauren Sarah Haynes, a Scottish musician and sound artist who builds and performs with hybrid analog digital instruments. She is a, quote, positively ferocious improviser. That's a Cycling 74 quote. Her music refusing to sit nicely between free improv, experimental pop, techno, and noise. Over the last decade, she has developed and honed a deliberately challenging and unpredictable performance system that explores the relationship between bodies, sound, environments, and technology. The Wire described her most recent album, Manipulation, as skittering melodies and clip-clopping rhythms suggesting a mischievous intelligence emerging from this web of wires. She is a member of the new BBC Radiophonic Workshop, and we welcome her today, and I'm quite excited to have her speak to us today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over. Hi, everyone. It's really fantastic to be with you here virtually today um, via the magic of Zoom. Um, firstly, thanks to Professor Thompson for inviting me to speak with you all today. Um, so as he said, I'm an improviser working with live electronics from about 2007. And today I'm going to talk about the evolution of my practice over these 14 or so years through the lens of the kind of conceptual paradigm um, of inactive music cognition, um, which is to say that musicking, as we all know, is not a uh, mental or skull-bound activity, um, but that musical meaning emerges from the ongoing dynamic and physical interactions between, say, a musician or a listener and their environment and materials that they work with. This way of understanding musical activity has provided me with a framework for the increasingly diverse range of research that I partake in. And while what I talk about today is related to my creative practice, I want to note that this inactivist approach has been a really fruitful springboard for me for expanding what I do into much broader inter transdisciplinary modes of working. Um, I'm in an interdisciplinary department, the School of Arts, Media and Engineering. Um, so this pushes me into all kinds of really interesting collaborations. Um, recently, I've been working with a speech and hearing scientist looking at improving music perception for people with cochlear implants. Um, I've also done some collaborations with a neurotechnology lab at the University of Houston. Um, we're interested in looking at music's effect on health and well-being. So even though I'll talk about my artistic work, it kind of um, takes me into these interesting interdisciplinary forays. So yeah, as I said, while we're going along, please do ask questions in the chat. I'll monitor it um, and we can go into detail on some of the particular pieces or techniques that I'm talking about. So let's just talk a little bit about this inactive embodied paradigm um, that I use to frame my work. I've put some references to papers as we go along. I do a lot of writing in my research. So, um, and these are all available on my research page, parisa.com as well for access. So the inactive music cognition um, paradigm has emerged as a challenge or perhaps solution to traditional cognitivist or certain embodied approaches to music cognition, which rely on the role of mental representations in musical experience. Cognitivist and computational theories of mind require higher level information processing and internal representations for cognition. This dualistic position suggests a two-stage process where information is received by the sensory system through physical encounter of sorts, which leads to some excitation of nerves in the brain. And the second stage involves the stimulation. Oh, I'm hearing some sounds. Um, the second stage involves stimulation of the nervous system, leading to a mental state or awareness of what's been gathered by the senses. So in the case of music, of course, this would be through sound picked up by the ears, but also by the body, perhaps also through watching a musician. Do we want to, is someone unmuted? <laughs> cool. Uh, thanks. 
Um, so the listener's brain would then process this information or in the opposite way, music is conceived in the brain and then expressed, for example, through notation or the act of composing. So the emergent viewpoint of embodied cognition holds the opposite of this, that cognitive processes are deeply rooted in the body's interactions with the world and thus individualized capacity for interactions. This concept draws on philosopher phenomenologist Maurice Mer Merleau-Ponty's work, which posits the body both as the perceiving object and at the same time as the subject of perception. So our experiences of the world are crucial here. The inactive approach is based on the idea that individuals are autonomous agents for whom cognition is formed in the process of living within their social, cultural and physical environments. This developmental process of identity and sense making depends on the sensory motor and effective coupling between the individual and the world. Varela, Thompson and Roche first proposed in action as a theoretical framework in cognitive science in the early 90s. Um, and more than three decades later within the fields of cognitive science and also philosophy of mind, inactivism is gradually being seen as a fruitful theoretical and empirical platform for studies of consciousness. I'm using this framework within my musical practice to be thinking about building instruments, performance systems and so on. So according to the inactive approach, cognition is embodied as a process of ongoing and dynamic sense making within the agent's biological and social cultural environments. It's intersubjective in that it depends on interactions with others and is an active process motivated by affects. Both the perceptive capacities of various organisms as well as the environment itself emerge through reciprocal coordination and co-evolution. So in biological terms, for example, this phenomenon is responsible for both the fact that bees can see ultraviolet light, but also ultraviolet reflectance patterns in flowers. So we're emerging and adapting uh, in our sensory capacities as the world itself emerges. And how can we think about this musically? So the most recent research acknowledges that more work needs to be done in the field of mu inactive music cognition. Um, thinking about musicking as a dynamic process of circular interactions between embodied agents and the environment in which they're embedded. We can perhaps move to a more participatory and relational understanding of musical experiences. So I saw someone in the chat asking, where did you first hear the word musicking and what does that mean to you? Um, and for me, that comes from Christopher Small's um, book on musicking, um, which is this idea of music not as a noun, as a thing, but as a verb, as an activity, as something that we do. Um, in this book, this then uh, talks about all the different actors who music, which includes not only performers, composers, audiences, but also the people that maintain the institutions and the buildings that musical activity takes place in, whether it's the person that sells tickets or people that clean these um, sites. So. It's a very um, social way of thinking about music as an activity here. So I will turn to my uh, background as a musical inactivist, and I can point to two pivotal moments in my musical evolution. So I'm thinking really historically here, my whole history as a person experiencing the world as informing what I do. Um, and I like to encourage my students to explore their own musical, social, cultural histories in their music making. So to bring their preferences, their skills to the table, even when we're learning something new, often in very interdisciplinary contexts. So firstly, I was extremely lucky and privileged to have piano lessons from a very, very early age. And I started composing using notation I'm baffled when I see this. This is when I was six. Um, and I was creating these pieces of work. Um, I kind of wish I'd stuck with composition, but I don't really call myself a composer anymore. Um, but I was also emulating what I heard on the radio as what I called modern music, but didn't realize until many years later that this was a legit legitimate mode of musicking called improvisation. Um, you know, I just had fun bashing key, keys on the piano uh, 
didn't know that this was something that that could be named and could be a legitimate practice. It's not surprising, perhaps, that having this training on classical piano, which began at this early age, has led me to explore musical HCI um, from the perspective of largely being focused around the expressive capacities of the hands and fingers. You'll see later on that I work with a lot of interfaces that build on these skills that I already had. Um, so maybe I was drawn to the piano because it's a very ubiquitous traditional Western instrument, very common in many cases. Um, but by learning that I could be musically expressive through my hands and fingers um, has led me into this musical uh, exploration of HCI based around that type of tactility and physicality. The next pivotal influence in my musical life, again, was being lucky enough to get one of these when I was quite young. Um, I think this is an Amstrad CBC 464. And although I really only started properly getting into coding around 2007 and just graphical programming languages like Max MSP, um, I did um, have some early experience coding on this where you would get computer magazines, which would have pages of code that you would have to type in um, to create games and there'd always be a mistake. And most of the challenge of this was finding where your mistake in the code was. So I have this early history of piano playing, of working with computers, working with games, which all sort of weaves in um, to maybe explain in a very simplistic terms why I've explored this approach to personal digital musical instrument design that focuses around relationships between sound and touch. So in this, I'm exploring two aspects of Merleau-Ponty's notion of embodiment of the body as both inner and outer through on one hand, themes of thinking about resistance, physicality, liveness, and also thinking about sound as vibration. Um, and I'll talk about some of the customized haptic or vibrotactile devices um, that I've made as we go along. Yeah, and the tape drive as well. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna turn to look at how these ideas have informed my works over the years and how I've worked with code to realize them. I'm gonna play an excerpt of one of my first works for piano and live electronics. So um, having had this history uh, and skill on this instrument, it was an obvious sort of place to start with this by augmenting this digitally. Um, so this is a piece from 2009 called Transient. Uh, the main idea with this piece was um, to use machine listening so that all musical material, acoustic or process would be determined by what I was doing on the piano itself. So everything would be picked up by microphones. Um, I didn't want to work with any additional controllers. So this meant that in my machine listening, I'm looking for um, different analysis of the incoming acoustic sound and from that deriving measures of what might be called silence, phrasing, the range on the keyboard and so on. Um, so of course these things don't exist, we have to construct them. So when I'm looking for silence, that's obviously just doing something like thresholding amplitude level and deciding when that silence might be found. Um, the processing uses live sampling, slicing, chopping up. Given the name of the piece, I use a lot of transient detection. Um, obviously this works well with the instrument because pressing the keys on a piano, we work a lot with transients, but this has interestingly informed the more general hybrid analog digital instrument that I perform with today. Um, so it's sort of been informed from the acoustic instrument of the piano in many ways. Um, yeah, as I said, I didn't want to work with external controllers. So I used a technique actually that the composer Hans Tuchku worked with a lot of thinking about time windows to develop a structured improvisation. 
um, so that things and changes will happen. Um, but hopefully I can trigger them with my playing. But if that doesn't happen, then we might move to a new section in the in the piece or the structure. So I'll play an excerpt from this. So you can see there is lots of sounds being recorded as I'm playing and um, based on dynamics, phrasing, pitch detection and so on, it's, it's um, triggering and modulating these various processes. Um, when I'm working with this type of machine listening, I'm not concerned with accuracy. I'm very interested as an improviser in the error um, that these things throw up. So I'm working with prepared piano here, which means that I'm putting different materials uh, between the strings, using lots of extended techniques, playing, uh, you know, with um, various objects or on the strings as well. So I'm not looking for things like accuracy in pitch detection. I'm interested in the sort of error or the noise that these um, types of processes throw up for me and then how I respond to them as an improviser. So the second piece that I'm going to play uh, is called Control from 2010, also for prepared piano and live electronics. Um, where I'm from in Scotland, people just give away lots of pianos for free. I think it's easier than them um, properly you know, passing them on so uh, in some way. So um, I spent a lot of time collecting free pianos and getting my friends to help me move them around Edinburgh um, for gigs and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of works that use these. Um, this is also a structured improvisation, also using this idea of time windows um, so that every time I play, it would be similarly structured, but still very fluid. Um, in this piece, I have the first use of a haptic feedback device. So even though the physicality of the piano felt, you know, very embodied and familiar to me as a performer, um, and while I could use the vibrations, the resonance of the instrument to inform my playing, um, the electronic sound that was being produced, although it comes from largely from the piano, sometimes has to add additional processes, synthesis and sampling in there as well. 
I felt very disconnected from the electronic sound. So my work into haptics, touch-based technologies really came from my performance practice, from this sense of disconnection from the sound that I was producing. Um, I really experienced this the first time I did laptop performance um, where Firstly, I felt no sort of vibration being produced from my gestures or the sounds that I was making and that I could produce very forceful or, you know, um, dynamic sounds with very little physical engagement, with very little effort. So I was curious about how I could reintroduce these into hybrid analog digital systems and um, acoustic digital systems or purely live electronic systems. So I developed this glove. This is like the first prototype I'm using an Arduino. It's connected to the laptop. You can see that it's a wired device, um, but because in this piece, I'm just sitting at the piano, it was fine. Um, it started off just by sending amplitude of the electronic sound to my skin so that I could feel um, the intensity of the digital sound that I was producing in addition to the acoustic sound that I could hear it through the ears. It also allowed me to receive more symbolic kind of um, representational information. Um, so if there were particular things that I had to trigger, for example, um, maybe I'd receive a cue telling me that, or if I wanted to ensure that I started live sampling and recording process, um, I could get some information about that. So I have two forms of information that it's sending me while I'm performing, both expressive information about the digital sound, um, but also more um, symbolic information. And eventually I could play these pieces without having to look at the laptop screen at all. And because it's such a sort of physically engaged instrument, that was super helpful. I think in this clip, I'm still using the screen because it was the first experiment. So I want to see if it works. Can I interrupt you for a second? Sure, um, yes. Because uh, I think that Mr. Corthy had a question. Um, Mr. Corthy? <laughs> yeah, before we, we move on, uh, I wanted to ask you about the, the previous piece. Uh, when you have that material, I think 
using like a glissandi, glissando in the in the black keys that you have like ta 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 ti ta 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 something like that. Uh, is that like the sound of the strings being uh, pressed, or is like the sound of the keys like in I don't know in where of Lachemann or I I couldn't. Yeah. I have a I have a wooden beater that I'm running across the keys. A, a what? Sorry. Um, like a percussion mount, like a wooden beater. Ah. Yeah. So ah, okay, okay. I, I think the challenge with this that piece was always trying to mic it up in such a way that I would have like key sound, but also uh, like string sound of the piano, but also I wanted to yeah. have all these noisier key sounds and things like that. It's, and it's quite tricky to get it right. Sometimes I've had overhead mics, sometimes I'd have mics behind. Um, in the next piece that I'll show, I actually ended up using these like really beautiful but expensive DPA microphones that um, you can actually use as a kind of boundary or contact mic with this, this pad that they come from and I put them underneath and they do the job really nicely. Um, the problem with micing for me is that I often played in collaboration with other musicians particularly percussionist and then all this acoustic sound is like going into my microphone <laughs> so it became really okay. difficult but yeah so that was um a, a wooden beater on the keys yeah yeah because it, it was like very loud to be like with just with the hand but at, at the same time was very a very particular sound that i didn't know how did you get it to be prepared yeah. The, the man <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is there? A, shall I read the question? I'm just reading a question in the chat also about cybernetics. Yeah, I'll talk about that. Um, if we have time, um, I'll talk about some of my sort of installation work as well at the end. Um, Absolutely, early cybernetics is the sort of origins of um, a lot of the inactive cognition theory. Um, Catherine Hales's work is a really good um, sort of historic lineage um, that she draws from that work to um, enact inactive cognition and body mind, and then later to sort of artificial intelligence. Um, so that's a really good resource for sort of linking that together. And I do write about that in one of my later papers, but yeah, that's absolutely a sort of influence to all this and how I try to build my improvisation systems. Um, and there's so much stuff from um, like really early cybernetics that I think is still fruitful, even though we're sort of in the era of like machine learning and things like that. Um, so there's, there's definitely an influence there. Great question, thanks. Okay, I'll move on to the next piece. Um, this is called Figurine Operated String from 2012. I'm going to play an excerpt from a live stream. I think this is my first live stream I did um, in 2020 after I resisted doing them for a few months and then decided that I would uh, have a go with live streaming. Uh, but in this piece, I was thinking about, okay, if I work with controllers and the piano, what would that be? And I actually ended up working with this um, controller that's super cheap. It's like $5 on eBay called the Game Track. Some of you might be familiar with it. Um, it was designed for playing PC golf because, you know, you would swing your hands. It's worn as two gloves which are tethered to say the ground. Um, and it's a really cheap way of getting X, Y, Z data, position data from each hand. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, but thinking about how I would fold this into my instrument, okay, well, what are the sort of boundary or expressive areas on the piano keyboard? And what are the sort of boundary or expressive areas in my digital system? And how can I maybe sort of just put these things together? So, um, we know that the boundary areas are often where the most interesting stuff happens, particularly if you're an improviser. So thinking about, you know, clarinet, multiphonics, breaking point, the fragility, um, or thinking about when, you know, a repeated uh, rhythmic sound is sped up and becomes a pitch, right? Um, so like boundary areas in the electronics or the sound part, and then boundary areas on the piano keyboard, well, a lot of the expression happens 
where my hands come down on the keyboard. So what sort of, um, I, I'll use the word mapping, but I'm thinking sort of slightly differently to how we think about mapping in terms of software, but putting together of these things could occur. So in this piece, I think I have a lot of stuff where I'm playing with phaseful coding of the piano sound or pre-recorded samples. I actually use a lot of um, bootcla samples that are recorded in Stockholm Electron Music Studio in this piece. Um, so thinking about, okay, well, maybe these can move between being completely frozen and moving when my hands are moving around on the keyboards. It also gave me, again, a nice way to control moving through various stages or settings in it. Um, and it really sort of ties my physicality into it. So I'm sh quite short and I find that playing on Steinways are, is always a little bit large for me. <laughs> and, um, so, but I could think about, okay, like the furthest reach that I can reach inside is obviously a boundary area. So what can I do with that? Even if it's just moving to somewhere else in, in the software, for example, um, this is on a much smaller piano, which is great for me. Okay, uh, let me just play a little extra of this one. I'll jump around. Let's just go from... Yeah, so I guess not only is the the changing of sound um, connected to my movement, but actually so is the structure of the improvisation as well, which was kind of interesting. Um, okay, so I also wanted to think about um, this idea of sculpting sound. Um, so not only working with haptic technology in terms of feedback, but also sound as something that could be sculpted or malleable or elastic. Um, so all types of sort of physical metaphors for manipulating sound. Uh, so I'll show a few pieces that explore various controllers for, for doing that. Um, I started working with 
the Novant Falcon back in around 2011. Again, this was a commercial games controller. Um, it was based on more um, sort of research focused haptic uh, interfaces. And it, it allows um, force feedback to be provided to uh, the player, or in this case, the performer. And uh, luckily, Ed Bardal and some other researchers developed a sort of uh, firmware for it to be interfaced with Max, um, in which I could then program in different types of physical forces that I would actually feel. So it's like this little robot thing that sits on the table, you see it in the video. Um, so I worked with coiled springs, so it allows you to sort of feel like you're pulling back on this coiled spring. You can program in um, the effect of like bouncing off different surfaces, even like a percussion, percussive, percussive membrane, for example. Or, of course, um, you could construct environments that don't exist in, in reality. So you could imagine something where you were bouncing off different surfaces that can then um, give way or reform. So there's lots of interesting possibilities with this. Um, a lot of this research sort of links to Claude Cadeau's work, thinking about using physical models um, and virtual instruments. I wasn't interested really in being limited with physical modeling uh, in terms of instruments, but more linking it to various processes. So even using the idea of viscosity, um, you know, to allow me to move through like looping of samples, but with some added resistance. I guess the example I always give is if you're trying to do a fade using like a fader on a MIDI controller, um, when there's no resistance, it's very easy to pull that fader down really quickly and mess up the ending of your piece. Whereas if you actually have some physical resistance to that, to lowering the volume, it can become much more expressive. Um, so even just by yeah changing like the feel of um, moving my hand through something viscous could give that. So I'll play a little excerpt of this piece for piano, trio and live electronics. You can see me playing the falcon um, and trying to just find ways to be as expressive as the acoustic instruments, although I'm kind of reluctant to draw those distinctions, but you'll see what I mean in the video. Here we go. with this interface called the Alpha Sphere. Is anyone familiar with that? Um, this was created as, a, as a, a startup company actually by Adam Place. And the idea with this interface, so it has these sort of um, elastic pads um, all around it. And a lot of the work, if you look it up on YouTube, um, a lot of um, musicians use it for doing some like filtering or in dubstep pieces where you can get like if you can imagine like using these pads on the really low bass sounds which is super cool um i used it in a piece uh with bass clarinet and trombone um it was a little bit large for me as an interface sitting on the tabletop but it's super nice to map say filters to this elastic pads and really sort of expressively play with filters or even mapping it to amplitude of samples and things like that. Um, so I'll play uh, an excerpt of this piece. 
Yeah, so you can um, check out uh, the Alphasphere on, on YouTube and look at some of these videos. Um, so question here, how do you interact with it? Are you touching the plates or hovering your hand over them? No, they're, they're elastic, so you really push into them. The smaller ones are much easier to push. The larger circles that you saw there actually take quite a lot of force to, to push them in. So you really get this resistance. That's what I'm looking for, to push against when I'm, say, you know, changing a low pass filter or something else. So um, yeah, it's a bit like a push pad in the MIDI controller. I think the original ones were designed using Arduino, um, but then they were manufactured commercially actually for a while. Um, so I'm not sure what technology was used in, in the commercially available ones. Uh, the original ones were 3D printed and, and using Arduino as far as I recall. Um, but I think you can still uh, track them down. They may still be in production as well. But yeah, super fun to play with. Um, so also since around 2007, I have been performing with, as you can see in the image here, um, uh, it's a PS2 controller, I'm told by my students. Um, and this happens because my tutor, Jules Wallinson, said go out to a game store, buy one of these, plug it in, hook it up to Max and see what you can do with it. And Again, as I mentioned before, working with tactility and my hands and fingertips, um, it was an instrument, an interface that just really worked for me and has stuck. So I'm, I'm kind of stuck with it. It's become one of my main um, in instruments, this system that you can see here um, that comprises of Mac software, um, game pads. I have voice processor, a couple of MIDI controllers, drum machines, analog synths. And someone was asking about cybernetics earlier. And the sort of paradigm in this is that rather than trying to represent uh, all the different parameters that I can work with here, um, it's so densely multi-mapped and everything feeds back into everything else that it becomes more of a kind of playground to explore. It's very unpredictable. Um, I don't always know what's going to happen. Um, so I'm sharing you know, sound from voice that goes into the voice processor, but then MIDI goes back from Max back into the voice processor. I have control data going from my hands, but that controls stuff on all the devices and the software. It's doing live sampling and analysis. So it does become through these kind of simple um, interactions that are set up um, quite a complex um, dynamic system. And that's something that I enjoy as an improviser, the, the unexpected, the unpredictable. Um, also thinking about a physical interface with the, the game controller and joysticks, um, as other people have said, um, you know, it's very easy to find the extremes of, of this. It's very easy to, to move joysticks with your thumbs. So a lot of the time um, I'm actually trying to hold things still, um, which is again, quite difficult to do or, um, you know, trying to not move very much, trying to um, resist moving even a few millimeters which could drastically change the sound that I'm producing. So there's other ways of building in resistances which as we know as musicians are where the most expressive uh, things can emerge. So all my research is thinking about how to reintroduce these ideas in systems that have largely digital uh, aspects to them. 
okay, let me play a little excerpt of this. This is from a live stream I did recently um, in collaboration with a visual artist called Kendra Sollers from Arizona. sometimes ask what type of synthesis do you use and I'm just not a purist I use I use any and every technique um that I can get my hands on but it, it you know it's this instrument that's evolved over these 14 years so um I've currently been working with um the Flucoma team uh, which is a research project at the University of Huddersfield they're developing new tools for audio decomposition and machine learning um, that can work in Mac, Super Collider, Reaper, um, um, other uh, creative coding environments. Um, so, you know, each time I introduce something new, there is a kind of um, like real struggle to think about how I integrate this with this instrument that's already very evolved and um, that often you know, doesn't need new development to discover new things. A lot of the times that the instrument develops is when I play with other people and other collaborators, other improvisers. Um, just do a quick plug uh, with some of the Flucoma tools that I've been working with. I just released an album a couple of weeks ago. It's on the Super Pang label. Check it out on Bandcamp. Um, and that's some, some of my kind of forays into machine learning are in this but it's really, um, really a new area for me. Um, but my interest in that lies in improvisation systems. So going back to this idea of um, not thinking about control, um, this ideal, I suppose, of having a system that will respond in unpredictable and creative ways, but still allows me to navigate through um, different sonic environments and how that might function in collaboration with other performers. So it's an ongoing uh, challenge. Um, I'll read a question. I know you said you prefer the discovery and unexpected aspects of the music you perform, but at the times when you'd want the opposite, total control of parameters versus unexpected improvisation. Yeah, when I'm doing gigs. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, often I, I regret my life choices, but um, but um, that's what I enjoy as a musician. Um, I mean, I guess it's just finding this, this balance, isn't it, between, um, you know, obviously I know my instrument pretty well. So there are aspects of it that I, I do, of course, have control of, right? Um, but it's kind of finding this tension between 
um, you know, kind of uh, like stasis and and um, exponential like emergence, I suppose. Um, what is your thought of two systems improvising off of each other with you as an influencer of source, but more hands off, just curious? Yeah, well, maybe this question segues nicely into um, the installation piece that I'll, I'll show now, because I think from these ideas, um, from the inactive model, um, and also from being asked to always play in uh, spaces that I couldn't uh, control, environments I couldn't control. So, um, you know, being asked to play in um, like a 40 meter high concrete mining structure in Sweden, Norberg Festival, or even just concert halls with different loudspeakers, uh, stage setups and so on. And sort of deciding that rather than um, trying to control this scenario, um, my approach would be to be quite site, site responsive in a sense. Um, so my instrument is developed in that way, but then thinking about how that could apply also to installation work. So I'm gonna just show this um, last example of um, a piece that goes into this kind of quite new area for me. It started off as like guerrilla performance, doing performances in, you know, tunnels and, and um, different environments and so on. And then thinking about how this could become practice that really fits in with these ideas. Um, so thinking about the role of the environment, of course, the environment is really crucial to um, um, inactive cognition and, um, and all that kind of history um, and ecological psychology and so on. So I'll play just this last example from a project called Sounding Out Spaces. Um, and there's a couple of papers here that go into these ideas in a lot more detail. Um, so it's informed by evolutionary biological systems. It looks at using embedded microcomputers. So I use the Bella um, system and environmental sensors along with feedback and this idea of self-adaptive systems to create emergent sound structures that are site responsive. Um, so it's not thinking about going out into environments and capturing the sound um, and then, you know, humanly organizing them into pieces um, that can be then performed in concert halls, but thinking about participating uh, with the environment and in this, piece. There are some other elements in the video that you'll see. It was part of a sort of larger project, but um, in the sort of ecosystemic part where uh, the sound is really only using what's being picked up through microphones. This works really informed by the work of composer Agostino De Scipio, who writes a lot about um, interact uh, composing interactions rather than interactive composition. Um, so thinking about, say, removing the role of the performer, this ties into that question that I was just asked. So um, being a little more hands off as a human in the system, perhaps. Let me play the video and uh, then I'll get back to questions.
And the project was in collaboration with um, an arts charity, uh, Free Arts, and uh, took place at a community garden. It was installed for, for two days. Um, when we were creating this piece, it was actually really difficult working with the desert environment. My collaborator, Julian Stein, had spent um, a lot of time creating these beautiful um, light sensors, photocells with conductive thread on some of the plants that you could see there as a kind of um, way to monitor activity and movement. And right before we opened, we had a massive dust storm. Uh, it was incredibly windy, but of course, again, that's these unpredictable elements that can't be controlled. So we had to work with that, unfortunately, um, managed to repair and managed to survive for the opening. Um, but yeah, so that's how some of these ideas kind of started to inform more installation work in my practice. But I think I will stop there um, and open it up to questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's really fascinating. I think this last part, um, talking about not sampling the world, but rather knowing about it in a different way is really an interesting idea. Uh, and in, in that context, you had a link to a paper that talked about autopoiesis, and I, I wondered if you could elaborate on that term a little bit. Yeah, this came from Varela and Maturana's work, um, um, Chilean biologists who were trying to look at ways of defining living systems, separating living from non-living. It's this idea of self-organization and self-maintenance, so how like a cell maintains itself and doesn't dissolve into the other things that are surrounding it. Um, and I'm sort of taking these ideas to think about how this could inform these sound systems and also their relationship to the environment. So like conceptually, it's interesting to explore again in the Dishipio's uh, work. Um, a lot of this language comes up as well. And it's thinking about how the environment can sort of perturb a system, but energy doesn't cross over from the organism to the environment. So in our sort of interpretation of that, we're using environmental sensors, but I guess, you know, the structure of the code maintains itself in a sense, and the sound maintains itself, the other agents in the environment feed into the system. So kind of, yeah, just drawing on these ideas to think about how we set this up. Um, but I, I definitely recommend reading some of his papers on this to look at the, the concepts of where this kind of work comes from. It uses a lot of feedback um, and some of the ways of setting this up from a technical perspective are quite simple. So we use a lot of um, like negative feedback to do this self observation and self adaptation. So um, there's a point I think in the video you saw where I just have sound being played through these tires, the physicality of the tires is kind of filtering and uh, constraining the sound in some way. And um, that's being then picked up and analyzed and fed back into, you know, I think frequency of the oscillator or something like that. Um, another thing is, you know, just working with feedback, of course, then looking at when it raises above a certain amplitude, filter it out again so that it constantly can, can grow and shrink. So those kind of um, approaches we took from this. Well, I had put in the a chat a little bit earlier something that's hard for me to articulate, so I'll just try to say it. <laughs> um, so, you know, you're exploring sonic spaces that are by design chaotic or unknowable to an extent in, until you get inside them and, and find your way around and, and learn learn about them, right? Uh, but, and I'm, I'm trying to put the word on it, the name on it of, of what that is, and looking at art science collaborations which is kind of what you're doing, um, where does that, how do we name this knowledge and fit it in? And I think of this more as 
trying to explain it to someone else to say this is valuable that someone does this uh, because this type of knowing is not the knowing that someone designing a machine learning algorithm is going to necessarily run across. Yeah, I, I think that's a super important question and issue. And it's something that I'm constantly, I guess, battling with uh, in my work, but also find sympathetic collaborators as well. Um, it also I've noticed is different depending on where I'm doing my work. Um, I guess even the idea of creative practice research is maybe less developed in the US compared to when I was working in the UK or Australia or even Canada. Um, so what I found in my work is firstly, you know, just stating it. So even in my PhD, you know, there's a, a good chunk of this was spent um, stating and describing what creative practice research is and why it's important. Um, but in terms of sort of interdisciplinary collaborations, I think it's a very uh, long and, and slow process that needs sort of generosity from all sides. Um, I think, for example, with the work um, that I started to do with the neuroscientists, and I was invited to do a 3D workshop at the University of Houston. And I, you know, I think that from their perspective, they were very interested in measuring my brain activity while I improvised. And we were also working with other faculty who were musicians and dancers. And we did sort of multidisciplinary improvisation together. But actually, and from my perspective, there was, you know, still work that had to be done in terms of language and vocabulary and understanding the type of practices that I do. Um, so I actually turned the whole neuroscience lab into a laptop orchestra and got them all to improvise using Max MSP and, um, you know, facilitate some very rapid ways for if we want to separate people into musicians and non-musicians, which I think is problematic anyway, but if you know we want to make these distinctions to actually get like the scientists doing uh, the musicking, and that can happen very quickly, and that's something I explore in my interdisciplinary improvisation class because you know I have students for all all different kinds of backgrounds, and um, not all, uh, all of them are musicians. I'm working with dancers and and. Um, engineers and people that are interested in working with animation or film so I just sort of learn very quickly how to find ways that we can all meet and experience these techniques and drawing on techniques from my fields um but also you know opening myself up as a researcher to you know some of my colleagues have uh, backgrounds in somatics and movement so doing as much of those types of practices so that I can then um, take that to my students. So yeah, working with this neuroscience lab, for example, um, by by doing the thing, you learn a lot. And I think that's been an approach that I that I use. So sometimes it's it's the stating and the telling, but also it has to be the doing as well. And I, I noticed that in some of the cognitive science research um, where there is, you know, a lot of um, observational study, but it could also be helped by actually engaging in the practices as well. So I think that's super important, but it takes a lot of time um, and with the pressures of things like grant writing and, and, and doing the research. Yeah, sometimes, um, sometimes the space for that is not always there. So I think creating those kind of environments is super important. Um, and that's why I think it's really important to, to stress how creative practice research can feed into so many different fields in this way. Any other questions? Just looking at the chat. Tyler, do you want me to, or? Yeah, that, I was about, I think I had the same problem as Dr. Thompson, having a hard time uh, articulating through words. Shall I read out your question maybe or? Uh, yes, please. Okay, so one topic I've been exploring extensively is the replicability, replicability of composed music. On one hand, this idea of discovery through performance and improv, 
makes the composer stand out as completely unique and allows for artists such as yourself to push the boundaries of music. On the other hand, total control of music via specific instructions and composed music leads to an easier replication of what the composer intended. Yeah, though slightly different each time. How do you find this balance and compose your music as a system that can be replicated? Yeah, um, personally, I, I just don't care. I don't care if my music isn't replicated. I don't care if it can't be played again. Um, I, you know, I'm even ambivalent about making recordings and albums. Um, I, I, this is obviously not the case for, for the vast majority of people. Um, and maybe this is a way of thinking about music that sort of I suppose precedes recording technologies, right? But um, yeah, I, I'm viewing musicking as this very social participatory thing. I work a lot with um, many different communities. I, when I was in the UK for 10 years, I worked with an arts charity, working with people with um, learning disabilities and um, autism and worked in dementia daycare centers and so on. And these are all musical experiences that are just as important and valid and from which I learn a huge amount um, compared to my own performance practice and I don't really see distinctions within this so yeah I'm not concerned with it but my music being replicated I guess the piece I showed with the uh, bass clarinet and trombone was I think one of the last pieces where I, I used notation um, and now I really don't tend to call myself a composer because I'm much more interested in these encounters with people through improvisation. Improvisation is a, a way that I can uh, allow these things to happen. So it doesn't solve your problem, but that's my perspective. It's very cool though. Very, very cool. Thank you. Very cool. I was just remembering a conversation I had with Letitia Tsunami, who is a improviser and, and someone who very early on used the sort of glove. And I said something like, you know, where can I find recordings of your work? And, and she said, well, you probably shouldn't because that's not my work. My work is ephemeral and it happens in the now. And once it's gone, it's gone. So you can't find a recording of it. You can find a recording of it, but you're not finding a recording of it. Yeah. Uh, so that that reminds me of what you just yeah, said. Yeah, she's she's fantastic. Um, I was lucky enough to see her at, at one of the nines a few years ago. Um, but yeah, I I agree. I think it's incredibly difficult though when you know we're faced with the increasing pressures for content creation and getting your work out there and particularly, you know, those of us who perform a lot. Now it's almost been a year since I've I've done a performance with any kind of audience and yeah it's you know I, why I was sort of reluctant to do live streams and now I have some live streams that are on YouTube and I sort of start to feel like I'm repeating myself because yeah it's not you know it's not really the thing although I have to say that I did feel um a kind of audience connection doing the live streams actually and there were some similarities that I didn't expect um but yeah it, it's something that I still um struggle with as an artist and also thinking about being an artist outside of academia as well which is important to me so um yeah it's something you have to really work out for yourself and all my students want to be content creators so Maybe what we need is some sort of haptic feedback for the live stream. So you can you can get a ping on your uh, haptic feedback device for every time someone, you know, reacts. <laughs> every time someone likes my video, I get a wee ping. <laughs> if I might say, yeah. I've seen something like this where, like, I think it's in, in spaces like Twitch, there is opportunities for people, their, uh, their audiences to, like, actually influence what's going on in the stream which is just such an incredibly cool thing and i think that could be amazing if applied to like the sort of the thing that we're talking about right now with live streams and music yeah i th i think um i love seeing the sort of inventiveness that's coming out of this moment and um, um i think i need to just i've done a couple of things on twitch i think the interactive 
element is um like there's definitely a potential for this kind of thing I mean I remember doing I used to do some performances with little bits which is a little modular um Korg synth kit sort of designed for for teaching kids electronics but they have a great Korg synth which sounds fantastic used it on stage and I did this kind of thing where where audience would like pick out the modules that I had to plug into my system so I thought about doing this um with yeah like over twitch or something like that where people could choose what I do um so yeah I think there's so much to be explored there some of the stuff that's coming out with kind of gaming and, and virtual environments over live stream um is really interesting um yeah I think we just have to wait and see what sort of um changes are going to come out of this moment it's, it's definitely an interesting time and there's definitely a lot of positives that have come out of this incredibly difficult and traumatic time as well particularly thinking about access for people to musical experiences so yeah any other questions I was going to ask uh, what what the name of that golf controller you said you were using on the piano was again because I, I I didn't catch it. Game track, game track. So you can probably find them on eBay still. A lot of people were buying them up for a while. Um, there's tutorials on how to use it in Macs and so on, um, or you can hack it and use it with an Arduino as well. So game track, yeah. Yeah, I think you can. If I remember correctly, Dan Truman, I guess, with his laptop ensemble, if I remember that correctly, used those extensively and I think wrote some papers about it. Uh, I do a lot of work with drum sets, so it sounds like a really interesting way to get like data from uh, like moving your arms around. And I think that sounds really, really interesting. Yeah, I think it would just be a case of not getting the, the wires tangled and stuff. So sometimes when I'm using the piano, the wires will go in between the keys and get stuck. Um, I mean, I know that there's now, you know, super cheap like wearables with accelerometers that that could, you know, maybe be more fruitful and less um, restrictive, perhaps. But they're so cheap, the game track, so you could certainly try it out and see how it works for you. Yeah. You could probably build one of your own. It's a pretty simple idea of just turning a potentiometer with string or wire. Um, I also had a question about the, you, you do a lot of work with prepared piano and I thought about this uh, early on. If you've ever done any work with like a, a disc limiter and a prepared piano, I, 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 it sounds like an interesting way to incorporate both of uh, the haptic feedback thing and um, everything else that you were talking about. With prepared piano. Yeah, I think it is super interesting. I've never had the opportunity. I've never been, you know, a lot of this work, let's acknowledge, comes from institutional support and being around what's available to me. So I've never had the opportunity to work with disc clavier. Um, yeah, I think it could be super interesting, um, particularly prepared piano, disc clavier. Was the Aphex twin of them not disc clavier? With the prepared piano, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I don't remember. Yeah, I think it was. I'll look it up. Yeah, that would be super cool. Um, yeah, no, I was just generally working with with abandoned pianos. <laughs> but I think, you know, what's important in my work is that whatever I have, and this is why I sort of moved away from that, is that I need to be able to either fix it myself, travel with it. Um, obviously, with pianos, I was requesting pianos in the venues um yeah I, I want to have things that I know that I can fix if things go wrong and that I can play in many different venues and spaces so that's a kind of factor that's really shaped what I do more recently well until March well speaking of, of spaces um Dr. Hayes played here at the Eagle Creek Brewery, if I remember correctly. I think I remember that right. Yeah, that was super fun. It's 2016, I think. So. Ah, yes, for Seamus, I think. Seamus, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, uh, yeah. 
that was so we had some we had some local people that would come through and get some new experiences and then the whole Seamus crew it was really interesting uh, just a little local connection here to Statesboro <laughs> that was super fun I really yeah I really loved traveling there it was great um I think some of the students from ASU also performed in the same uh, concert. So yeah, yeah. That's right, with the dinosaur skull. That's right, Courtney Brown, yeah. 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 See, now that I've said dinosaur skull, everyone is thinking, wow, I really missed something now. <laughs> <laughs> you should check it out, it's a super cool project. It was also at nine, I think in 2011 as well. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for speaking with us. It's been a real honor and it's a very interesting and engaging um, presentation that I thank you for. And um, we look forward to hearing more about your work. We will definitely check out your album and maybe have a, a listening session sometime. Uh, Great. Fun. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me. It's been really fun chatting with you all today. Um, please keep in touch. Send me um, any um, updates in your work or ways that this might influence what you're doing. I'd love to hear about that moving forward. And um, thanks again to Professor Thompson for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you.